Welcome to Rule 7, Roster and Lineup. We're going to spend some time looking at what is written in this rule, but we're also going to pay attention to what is not written in this rule. Of course, knowing the rules is important, but what is equally as important is knowing how to make the rules work for the situation you are in. The time before the match is our greatest opportunity to use some preventive officiating and show the coaches that we're not so bad and we're not all out to get them. The first article of this rule lays out the roster and when it's due. Notice that the only required information on the roster by rule are the names and numbers of the players. There's nothing in the rules that states that coaches' names or other bench personnel needs to be listed, although we tend to see coaches include that information too. The coach who attends the pre-match conference should turn in the roster at the conference. New this year is a rule that allows coaches to make changes to their roster until 10 minutes before match time. Try to get your roster checks done before that time so that if you find any discrepancies, you can have the coach make that change to the roster for free instead of costing them a point after the 10 minute mark. Part C of this rule has taken on some interesting interpretations by referees and by coaches over the years, so I'd like to take a moment to address it explicitly so we're all on the same page. There is no requirement that the libero be identified on the roster unless that player might wear two different numbers during the match. For instance, if we look out to the court as we check the roster and see that player number one is wearing the Libero jersey, as she is in the picture above, and the roster just says number one, then we can expect that number one is her only number. She will wear that number whether she plays as the Libero or as a regular player. There is no requirement that the letter L accompany that number on the roster. The only time we need to see an L on the roster is if that player will be wearing a different number as a regular player. So if she is number one as the Libro, but number 15 as the regular player, then we should see both numbers listed with an L next to her Libro number. Please don't go to the coach and request that the coach put an L next to the Libro if all the players have just one number and the roster checks out against the uniforms. But if you notice that no player is in a Libro uniform while you're looking at the uniforms checking the roster, maybe go ask the coach who will the Libro be just to verify that there isn't a second number out there. Here are the penalties listed for roster issues. The change this year allows for an unnecessary delay to be given for a late roster submission, that is, a roster that comes in after the pre-match conference. The rationale for this rule change is that the penalty used to be a point loss of rally, which is pretty severe for the offense. And it also allowed for a team to potentially get penalized two points if they both submitted a roster late and had to make a correction after the 10 minute mark. Ouch. Talk about an uphill climb for the referees that would have had to enforce those rules. So we are happy for that change this year. Article two is all about the lineup. This rule is deceptively simple. I mean, how hard can it be to list six numbers and maybe a seventh for the Libero? And yet there are so many ways that coaches have found to mess it up. So we have what feels like a million scenarios that we have to be very familiar with and ready to implement the instant they occur. What if there's a duplicate number in a starting spot? What if the duplicate is also a Libero number? What if a space is just left blank? What if there's a number listed that isn't a number on the roster? And what if the coach just writes a number for a player who doesn't even exist? What if any of those issues is discovered before the deadline for lineup submission? What if you discover it after the deadline? What can and what should you do about it? There are so many things. More on some of that when we get to Article 4 but I do strongly recommend that you take a second to read the situations listed for 7-1-2 in the casebook. On to Article 3. I don't have a whole lot to say about this one, except maybe to mention that once a coach submits a lineup, especially before the match and if they submit it really early on, try and discreetly protect that lineup from the view of other people. The other team isn't allowed to cruise by the scorer's table just to take a peek at their opponent's lineup before they decide where to put their own players on the floor. You don't need to like guard it with your life or anything, but maybe just flip it over and leave it face down on the table. Just a thought. 
Okay, let's take a quick break from the rules just to see what the procedure for checking lineups looks like. Here's a video. In this clip, we're going to see how to properly check lineups. Scott Hanley will be checking the lineups of these two teams. The team on the right has the serve. They've just submitted their lineups, so Scott is letting the scorers write down the lineups and he's verifying that they are written correctly on the score sheet. Then he'll pick up the lineup sheets and head out toward the court. He goes to the serving team's side first and he steps out to make sure that the right six players are on the floor. Notice that he gets into whatever position he needs to be able to see their numbers properly. Once he knows all the right players are on the floor, he lets the libero on the floor and then he indicates who the captain is. And then he goes to the receiving team side to do that all over again. Now the camera's going to move so you won't be able to see him complete the lineup check on that side. But I just want to mention one thing I really like about Scott's technique, and that is that when he gives his signals, like letting the Libro on the floor or indicating the captain, he is stationary when he does that. He's not wandering around the floor. He returns the lineups to the table, gets the ball, and tosses it to the serving team, and then moves to the receiving team side and takes his position and indicates that he is ready. And that's how you check the lineups. Okay, remember all those crazy scenarios from a minute ago? Here they are mostly spelled out for us. Before we go through the possible errors, I cannot stress enough that you must know the deadlines. These change with each rule set. So let's have a quick reminder. Under NFHS rules, before the match starts, the lineup is due with two minutes remaining in the pre-match warm-up period. In between sets, the lineup is due with one minute remaining. If a coach looks like they're not making attempts to get the lineup in on time, maybe they're busy warming up with their team before the match, or maybe they're reaming their team out for missing all their serves in that last set, then do what you can to gently remind or inquire about the lineup before the deadline. The sooner you get the lineup before the deadline, the better, because it gives you more time to do a preliminary check for errors. Are the starting six player numbers unique? Is a Libro listed? If so, is the Libro's number unique? If you said no to any of those questions and there's still time left before the deadline, then you are here to save the day. Go back to the coach, point out the error, and let the coach quickly fix it. Hopefully they will remember that kindness later on. Part A of this rule deals with how to handle non-existent players. If the deadline passes and we find that player number eight on the lineup does not exist on the bench, maybe the coach meant to write number 18 instead, then the coach will need to take a legal sub. We call this kind of sub a phantom sub because there's not really an exchange of two players, but rather there's a player exchanging with a phantom non-existent player. If the non-existent player is the Libro, so in this case, if there is no player number two on the bench, then the coach gets to designate a new Libro free of charge. That's a new change for this year, and the change was made so that the procedure would be the same regardless of whether the non-existent player is a regular player or the Libro. So yay for simplicity. Part B of this rule deals with duplicate numbers. In the example, you can see that number 22 was duplicated. It was written in for both starting position six and for the libero. If this is found after the deadline, the coach can either change the libero number for free or use a substitution for the regular player. Now I know you are a very observant official who would certainly catch an obvious error like this one well before the deadline and get the coach to fix it without penalty. But what if you're boxed into a corner because the coach handed you the lineup right at the deadline? Make sure that when you approach the coach, you tell them the problem and then tell them the choices they have to resolve it. In this case, I might say, coach, we have number 22 written down for both position six and the libero. You can either pick a different libero or you can use a sub for position six. Telling them their choice is, is important for a few different reasons. First, it gives them information that they might not otherwise have. They probably don't know the rules quite like we do. 
Second, it keeps them from making up their own resolution and just taking liberties where we don't have them. Like, I just need to switch these four people around. No, you don't get to do that. And third, it might be a moment of panic for them, realizing that they've made a mistake. So you giving them their options helps them make a clear-headed decision. One of the possible scenarios that is not explicitly written into this rule is a duplicate number starting in two positions. In this example, number 22 was duplicated for both positions two and six. The casebook makes a note that if this happens, the coach can choose which of the two positions number 22 actually belongs in. And for the other position, there must be a legal substitution, that is, a phantom sub. Finally, the rule lists penalties for submitting late lineups. Notice it is a harsh penalty, a point loss of rally just for submitting a late lineup. Personally, I would not want to have to enforce that, so I know that I will do what I can to help those coaches get their lineups in on time. Okay, that's it for rule number seven. Make sure you spend some time with this one and really get to know those different scenarios and when to apply them and what the right answers are going to be at different points in between sets. This one is really critical to helping us get off on the right foot with coaches, especially when they make a mistake and they're not sure what to do, we can swoop in with all the answers. It may not always be the answers that they want to hear, but at least it's an option and they're not flailing wondering what they should do when they wrote down a wrong number. This is your opportunity to save the day. Knowing this rule can help coaches out of some scrapes and can help you along the way. Okay, good luck, and I will see you in rule eight.